Hey everybody, and welcome to today's video lecture on clarity, the first of the four C style principles that we'll be talking about throughout this course. Now in this lecture, I wanna cover three main topics. First, I want to define our terms. I wanna talk about what the word clarity refers to. Next, I wanna talk about some tips for writing clearly. And finally, I wanna talk about how we can put these tips to work in our writing. So let's begin by defining our terms. And the first thing to say here is that the two style principles that we'll be focusing on this week, clarity and concision, these primarily enhance your writing at the sentence level. If you wanna learn how to build strong links between sentences, how to enhance the flow of your writing, if you wanna learn about uh, paragraph structure or document structure, hang tight, we'll get to that stuff. But this week, we're mainly looking at techniques for enhancing your writing at the sentence level. And the first and most powerful of these techniques we call clarity. Clarity principles, they make your sentences easier to read and to understand. That is the purpose that they serve. But how do we achieve this? Well, to understand this, we'll discuss some tips for writing clearly. But first, we need to understand what defines a clear sentence. Clear sentences are sentences that answer this question, who does what to whom? And they're sentences that answer that question in that order. They, identi they identify who is responsible for an action, they then identify the action itself, and then they close by identifying the recipient or the outcome of the action, okay? But while that's a powerful definition, it's not necessarily uh, useful. It's not something that we can easily apply when we're actually writing in the real world. So to make this concept more manageable uh, and more useful, we've broken it down into a series of tips and techniques that you can more easily implement in your writing. These tips and techniques are as follows. So first you want to use concrete subjects. Second, you want to prefer active voice to passive voice. Third, you want to avoid buried verbs. Fourth, you want to avoid negative language like not or un. And finally, you want to avoid inactive verbs. That list admittedly contains a number of technical terms that you may not be familiar with, and that's fine. We're going to define all of these in the course of this video lecture. So just hang tight for those definitions. Let's now talk about the first of these tips. Use concrete subjects. Whenever possible, you want to make the subject of your sentence a person, place, or thing capable of action, right? That's the who in the who does what to whom. And to keep your subjects concrete, you want to avoid two very common uh, categories of error. You want to avoid dummy subjects and you'll want to avoid vague pronouns. Dummy subjects are placeholders, right? They're, they're not a uh, person, place, or thing capable of action. They're just a placeholder. And they typically consist of it or there, followed by some version of the verb to be. To make this more concrete, let's take a look at two examples of sentences that contain dummy subjects. It is essential that we take steps to retain market share. That's one example. And there are several options for renewing the contract. That's another. In the first sentence, the dummy subject consists of the words, it is. And in the second sentence, the dummy subject consists of the words, there are. To fix these uh, errors, it's pretty easy. All we've got to do is remove those dummy subjects and revise all, both sentences so that they begin with a person, place, or thing capable of action. So in that first sentence, we revise it as follows. We must take steps to retain market share. And then the second, we revise it as you have several options for renewing your contract. Dummy subjects are a problem because they're vague, right? They're placeholders. They're not people, places, or things capable of action. Uh, they're wordy. It's oftentimes a far more concise way to uh, frame your sentence than to begin it with a dummy subject, and they often lead to passive voice, which is a problem that we'll discuss momentarily. 
And to fix dummy subjects, as we saw earlier, all you've got to do is replace them with one of those people, places, or thing, uh, things that is capable of action, right? Replace that dummy subject with a concrete subject. Vague pronouns, on the other hand, are pronouns that lack clear reference, right? It's not clear what they refer to. Any pronoun, as you might guess, can be a vague pronoun. But the most common vague pronouns are this, that, these, and those when they're not accompanied by a noun. Uh, we've got two sentences or sentence fragments here that include vague pronouns. This indicates a return to, whatever, or those will not do. Fortunately, uh, vague pronouns are even easier to fix than dummy subjects. All you've got to do is put a noun after the vague pronoun. So we take uh, this indicates a return to, we add a noun, this initiative indicates a return to. And we fix the problem. Those will not do, we fix it as those solutions will not do. Vague pronouns are a problem because they confuse readers, because they slow readers down, and because they oversimplify ideas. A lot of times we use vague pronouns to represent very complex concepts, sometimes even complete sentences. And that's just way too much weight to put on a single word. If you're going to use pronouns, and pronouns are fair game in this class to be clear, you want to make sure that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the pronoun and the thing it represents, right? So it for the car or he for the boy, that's totally fair game. But when you start uh, burdening a single word with a big concept or the contents of an entire sentence, that's just way too much. To fix vague pronouns, as we saw earlier, uh, you wanna put a noun after this, that, these, or those. It's very simple. All right, now let's move on to our next clarity tip, which is the importance of preferring active voice to passive voice. And to understand this, uh, understand why this is so important, we need to define active voice and passive voice. Whenever possible, you want to describe events using a logical cause-effect chronology. This is another way of saying that we want to write in active voice because active voice describe sentences that follow that logical cause effect chronology. Active voice sentences, they start with the actor, they then move on to the action, and they end with the action's recipient, right? Cause, effect. An example of an active voice sentence is this. The state agencies implemented the program, right? The sentence begins with the actor, it then moves on to the action, and then it, then it then closes with the recipient or the outcome of the action. And those are the types of sentences that you want to use. Uh, active voice is good. Use active voice as much as you can. Passive voice sentences, on the other hand, move in the opposite direction. They invert that conventional cause-effect chronology. And, Another problem with them is that you can use passive voice to omit the actor. All right, let's look at uh, a revised version, or at least a different version, uh, of that sample sentence that we looked at uh, earlier. So instead of uh, saying that the state agencies implemented the program, we're now saying the program was implemented by the state agencies. In this case, we're beginning with the recipient or the outcome of the action, then moving to the action, and we can either choose to include or not include the actual actor, all right? Uh, typically, passive voice sentences are going to be more indirect, less clear than active voice because they don't follow that standard cause-effect chronology uh, that's kind of hardwired into our brain and our expectations. So passive voice is a problem um, as we've suggested earlier, because it allows writers to omit a sentence's subject. Sometimes this can be useful, but oftentimes it just leads to confusion and ambiguity. Um, who implemented the program? I don't know. The sentence doesn't say, right? That's a problem that uh, can be caused 
uh, by passive voice. Passive voice is also a problem because it inverts a sentence's logical cause effect chronology. Another topic that we've discussed previously, right? You want to follow that cause effect chronology that your readers are expecting. It's going to be clearer. It's going to be more direct. It's going to be more effective. Now, how do we identify passive voice? There are a number of different ways, but my personal favorite way is by using the zombie test uh, to detect instances of passive voice in your writing. Here's how that works. You can insert the phrase by zombies after the primary verb in your sentence or clause. And if that sentence makes grammatical sense, not logical sense, but grammatical sense, up to and including the phrase by zombies, then you've written your sentence in passive voice. Let's look at an example. <clears throat> the letter was received by the assistant. What's the primary verb or verb phrase there? It's was received. So we're going to put the phrase by zombies immediately afterwards. The letter was received by zombies. Now, that phrase, again, it doesn't make logical sense. There is no such thing as zombies, at least that we know of, but it makes grammatical sense. Because it makes grammatical sense, that means that the sentence is passive voice, which we want to avoid. So how do we fix that? We flip the sentence around so that it moves from actor to action to the recipient of the action. And now the revised version reads, the assistant received the letter. Now, passive voice can occasionally be useful, but you want to reserve passive voice for when the object of a sentence is more important than its subject. For instance, the cost was calculated to exceed $5 million. In this case, it's probably not important who did the calculation. The recipient of uh, the, the action, the, the calculation, which is the cost here, is more important than the actor. You also can reserve passive voice for instances when you want to avoid assigning or taking blame. Uh, the file was incorrectly archived, and you know maybe you don't want to blame it on the intern, so you just omit the person responsible by using passive voice. Just the file was incorrectly archived. By whom? We don't know. Next tip, avoid buried verbs. Whenever possible, you want to replace nouns in your writing with verbs. Uh, verbs are more active, they're more memorable, they're more dynamic than nouns. So why are buried verbs a problem? Um, they're a problem because these are verbs that have been converted into nouns, typically using an I-O-N or M-E-N-T suffix. Once again, we've got some examples of sentences that include buried verbs. He did an analysis, that's a buried verb of analyze, of the transformation, that's a buried verb of transform, of our communication buried verb of communicate. Or in the second sentence, it is important to take all financial factors into consideration, right? A buried verb of consider. Now, uh, it is as highlighted because that's a dummy subject. And so when we revise this, we want to take care of all of these clarity issues. So here's how we would do it. We would take that first sentence and revise it to read, he analyzed changes in how we communicate right? So analysis becomes analyze. Transformation becomes changes. It's still a noun, but it's a more conversational noun. And communication becomes communicate. And then in the second sentence, we get rid of that dummy subject, replace it with a concrete subject with we, and we take consideration and make it into consider. We must consider all financial factors. Buried verbs are a problem because verbs, like I said earlier, are more memorable the nouns, and also because readers hate I-O-N and M-E-N-T words. They sound very technical. They sound very jargony. Uh, they're just not friendly words. People don't want to read words like that. Now, let's talk about some uh, advanced clarity techniques. Uh, these are techniques that you should try to master, uh, but they are a little bit more advanced, a little bit more nuanced than the techniques that we just discussed. So the first of these is the importance of avoiding uh, negative language, and the second is the importance of avoiding inactive verbs. So whenever possible, you want to frame your sentences positively, 
and you want to use active verbs. Now, when I say frame your sentence positively, I don't mean that every sentence has to be happy. You can still talk about negative topics. When I say frame sentences positively, what I mean is avoid words like not or un, right? Sentences that use uh, not or un are indirect, right? You're making a statement by saying what something is not rather than what it is, and they're easy to misread. Uh, not and un are very small words and your, your eye can just glance right over them. You want to avoid inactive verbs, on the other hand, because messages that overuse inactive verbs like to be or to have are boring and lifeless. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that you can never use uh, some version of the verb to be or some version of the verb to have. They're essential verbs. We need to use them. But if you rely too heavily on them, your writing just becomes static. It lacks energy and dynamism. So when you can try to minimize your use of those kinds of verbs. Now let's close this out by talking about how we can put these tips to work in your writing. So remember that all of these tips, they're guides, not rules, right? We're talking about style principles, not grammar rules. These techniques, they're suggestions. They're not things that you always have to do. Writing is about choices, as we've talked about earlier. And so you should only use these style principles when they're better than the alternative. Sometimes you'll come across a sentence and it just makes more sense to use a dummy subject or to use a buried verb or even to use something like a vague pronoun or passive voice. That's fine. Just think about what the alternative to that word choice or that approach is. And if there's something better, use it. But you don't, you don't have to adhere to these tips and principles religiously, right? Just uh, if you choose to, to include uh, any of these issues that we've identified throughout this video lecture in your writing, please make sure that you're doing so consciously and with intention. And with that, let's bring this video lecture to a close. Thanks for watching, everybody.